Welcome you all on behalf of the University of Florida IFAS Extension Cole County. Thank you for joining us this uh, Saturday morning for our gardening and landscaping webinar on Ask the Experts Orchids. So thanks for joining us today. Um, I'll quickly just go through um, our webinar team consists of Ann Yazalanis. She's our residential horticulture agent and master gardener volunteer coordinator. Um, and she'll be directing questions and topics this morning to our experts. I'm Julie Shelb, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator. Here is our um, panel of Master Gardener volunteer experts. This morning we have Kathy, Linda, and Mary with us. And so now um, we'll get started and I'll pass it off to Ann. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think we'll have a good webinar this morning on orchids. And so you can kind of see here what we're gonna talk about. I will also be monitoring the chat. So like Julie mentioned, if you have questions on that topic as we're going through, you can type them in the chat. And then at the very end, of course, we'll, we'll allow for more questions and you can unmute and things at the end. So we're gonna quickly talk about the different types of orchids, uh, where you can grow them, um, care for orchids, uh, how to uh, create more orchids through propagation techniques, and maybe some common problems you have had with orchids, and then a little bit about the orchid societies and shows that can help you out. Okay, so we're gonna have um, just kind of a brief intro of some of the common types of orchids. And we're gonna have Linda just, um, just briefly touch on them. We'll talk about maintenance of all of these when we get to that maintenance section, but this is just an intro of, you know, maybe these are things you grow now or that you've seen um, at a, a plant show or something like that that you're interested in. And certainly you can ask specific questions on those as far as maintenance as well. So I'll pass it to Linda for that. Good morning, everyone. Um, Julie, is this the next slide? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The, um, one of the, you know, orchids are one of the largest groups of plants in the world. And one of the larger groups that we tend to see around Florida are the cattleyas. And these just happen to be some pictures of some cattleyas that have bloomed in my yard. Um, they're a variety of colors. You almost can get them any color you want. Um, and the maintenance of them is fairly consistent across most of the cattleyas. Okay, Julie, next one. Oh, and here's some more cattleyas. Again, well, some of them that's a, uh, they're in my yard. And you can see I grow my orchids primarily outside, um, hanging from a tree. Um, the white one in the middle is a skinneri that's real common here in Florida. And um, the one on the far, left, the uh, sassy one is just one of the bluest ones I've seen because it's a really blue color, even though it didn't show up as well in here. I grow nobile dendrobiums. The, the dendrobium family is huge. And um, for me, I like these because they're, for me, easy to grow. They take a little more sun maybe than some of the other orchids. But um, they grow quite well, again, in the, in the same kind of thing. Need probably a little bit more light than my cattleyas. But um, you can get these, um, if you buy these, some of these are tough to grow, but the ones that are easy to grow are really easy to grow. These are oncidiums. I've got um, the middle one, I don't know the name of it. Someone gave it to me. Um, that's a good, okay, do I ask a question? Um, the Onsuba Specialum is a species orchid. It blooms, these are called dancing lady flowers because the flower itself looks like dancing ladies. If you, um, the one on the far right is called cherry baby and that's the chocolate spelling orchid. If you go up close to this orchid and give it a whiff, it smells just like a chocolate candy. It's absolutely delicious smelling. Okay, Joe asked a question, how can you tell the difference? Um, and I might ask for some help on this. Um, the oncidiums um, have really small root fibers, a fibrous root system. And normally there are two types of oncidiums, but as a general rule, they have sort of a flat, large, the, the, the group these represents are what they call the larger ones. Um, my orchid, 
it's the yellow orchid that you're looking at, it's probably gets to be two feet by two feet in my yard. It's huge. Um, they grow again like sun. Anybody else? Joe wanted to know how to tell the difference between the orchids. Kathy, you want to help here? Yeah, there's so many different types of orchids. If there's any like um, key features to tell them apart, um, Kathy? She's muted, it looks like. Oh. Mary, you want to jump in? Do you have any other tips on ways to tell the difference? Um, sure. Uh, with uh, with oncidiums like you're looking at here, the flowers come on huge sprays. You can see that the flowers are relatively small on these, but there's a huge number of them. Um, many times when you see these, uh, the leaves are very almost grass-like and they will come from a big flat, what we call a pseudobulb. Uh, if you can hop backwards one to the dendrobiums, these don't, these have canes. As you can see here, these flowers are coming directly off of tall canes. Uh, they don't really have the big, heavy, fat pseudobulbs that you would see in a lot of your oncidiums. Uh, these flowers come now some dendrobiums will come on a spray uh, these are the noble types grow individually right on the canes um, if you'll hop back one more Hang to on, the one okay what are the comment about the dendrobiums is they get really tall the, the canes can get really tall so yeah you, some of them do them, yeah so some, get, some are miniatures, some get really tall. The older forms of these guys get sometimes five, six feet tall. And they're gorgeous when they're in bloom because they bloom all along that cane. Um, the, uh, the Catalea orchids are what people <laughs> used to call corsage orchids. Um, man, they make a much, much larger flower, as you can see right here. These, these flowers are much larger. Some of them are probably three, four, even five inches across. And of course right. they have a lot fewer orchids per spray. Great, I think that kind of helps um, seeing the difference between those types of, of orchids. So we'll skip back, <laughs> Sorry. back to the uncidiums. Nope, that's fine. We are gonna continue on. I think we have one more type to talk about. Linda, if you wanna. Yeah, this is the cymbidium orchid. This is the one that is a, normally considered a cold weather orchid. And they're difficult to grow here, but I have found this orchid and I actually got it from a friend. Um, and you can see I grow this like I do Lyropia in my yard. So, and it blooms all year long and it's getting, it likes the winter time. Um, it doesn't seem to freeze. And it just grows, if you think of a Lyropia with an orchid bloom that's yellow like that, that's what this particular cymbidium does. Now I have the other cymbidiums too, the normal ones that you buy, and they do bloom once a year. Um, but they're not, they're not like this. This thing just goes to town. Okay, so we did have a question in the chat about, about which ones are the easiest to grow and we'll just hop right into um, where to grow your orchids. I know indoors or outdoors, um, if you have experience growing orchids, you might feel that one is easier for you than the other. Um, so we'll talk about how to grow them. So um, we'll have Kathy start a little, talk a little bit about growing and maybe mention the one that's easiest for you to grow. Um, Dendrobiums are usually easier for me to grow and you kind of just let God take care of them. Um, you have to fertilize them every couple of weeks and water. Basically, it's the same things that you do for most all orchids. They may have a little bit of different things like um, in the upper right is a van, Vanda and they have the long roots and they have to basically be outdoors hanging. Um, and on your 
um, one picture below it is um, on Sidium and that's one of the dancing lady groups. And I have that and I have it growing on a big pot and the pot got too big. The orchid got too big for the pot. So I put it into a bigger pot and now that pot is huge and I just really don't know what to do with it. But um, the picture on the left, my husband made me the table, which is eight by four. And then it's got a wire tabletop instead of, um, wood and I keep my orchids on that um, most of them outside under an oak tree um, we have a lot of wind from the lake and so he put um, a wall behind it built a wooden wall that is angled so that the air goes through it but it's not a heavy strong wind because the wind here on the lake gets to be very several days long um, but uh, that way, when I water the plants, the water goes down to the ground, it just drains right through. And that um, when I use the hose, I try and flush them out, flush out the salts. Um, there's too many to take and put in the sink in the kitchen, so I have to do it that way. Um, but that's pretty much when they bloom, I bring them into the house so I can enjoy them, and then I water them in the sink. Um, Kathy, I, can you um, can you briefly talk about, um, so I think most of you, um, Mary, Kathy, and Linda, grow them outside and then bring them inside. So um, what do you do with them in the, the winter months? Um, do you leave them? Do you bring them in? Do you move them in and out? Um, what do you do with yours? I leave mine outside unless it's going to, and even when it freezes, I'll put them, um, I'll cover them over. I have some um, frost cloths that I put over them mm -hmm. to protect them, but I leave them right in their own environment because okay. that way they're more comfortable. And if you'll see their shade and stuff like that and light sunlight going through, um, that they're acclimated to that um, environment. If I'm in the house, they have to readjust and so it's easier to leave them right outside and then just cover them over for the bad days. Um, what um, about you, Linda? I know you, looks like you have some as a landscape as well. So what do you do? I am, I'm like Kathy, I live outside. Um, if I know it's gonna get below freezing, um, sometimes I, mine hang in trees. Sometimes I just take them out in the tree and set them down. So they're closer to the ground and put some uh, freeze cloth on them. The sabidiums, really, I've had them, the year that we had the really bad freeze, um, they're the only thing that didn't freeze in the yard. So, um, but I'm not Kathy, I, I let, and then occasionally I've taken them in to the garage. But I'm like Kathy, leave them out, sometimes sit them down with some freeze cloth on them. And again, that all goes to um, choice of orchids. You know, there are some orchids that, um, I have one orchid particularly that when he gets down to 35, it suffers, but not, like I said, so look to see where the temperature uh, for your orchids, and you might have one or two that won't take cold weather, but in the last five years, I think I've put my orchids down once. So, Lynn, did you know the temperature that the cymbidiums can handle? Pretty low temperatures, it sounds like. Yeah, they handle, they're the cool, cool weather ones. That's right. why I'm surprised they do as well as they do in my yard, but they do, so... Like I said, when you, when you uh, buy, I guess my bottom line is to buy orchids that you know do well in your area. So buy from local people who are growing orchids because they'll know. If you buy one from Thailand, you know, you've got to play with it. Mary, do you have anything to add about um, the indoor outdoor growing? Um, um, a lot of orchids, that's one of the things that I feel gives people trouble with orchids. If, if you've got a pool and you've got an enclosure for a pool, you've got a screened porch, uh, they'll grow wonderfully in those areas. But there again, you still have to kind of play with how much light it gets, that sort of thing. They'll grow great outside. But when people try to grow them strictly indoors, a lot of times they don't do well. 
because a lot of times you can get the right amount of light, but you can't get the right amount of airflow because they do take airflow. They don't do well in stagnant air areas. Um, and they're so much easier to water and make sure that the water flushes through their pots. Uh, so they're just much more simple to grow outside, find a place they're happy, and then bring them inside. When they start to bloom, when they've set their, their buds and they start to open, then you can bring them inside and enjoy them the whole time they're in bloom and then take them back outside. Uh, that's what, you know, all these lands, all these houses that you see all these beautiful orchids in, that's mostly what they do. Uh, right, and, yeah. You know, and, the, and one thing about the cymbidiums, a lot of those are actually grown even farther up north, mm -hmm. right in the ground. That's why there's some cymbidiums that will not bloom here because we don't get enough. It's kind of like peaches and plums. They, mm -hmm. need, the, they need the cool hours. They need the chill hours. Great. Yeah. Thank you for, for talking about that. And, and, you know, the nice thing about bringing them in and out is too, as, as they, they bloom, you'll have different colors and bloom shapes and all of that coming in. So great. Right. Right. Um, and yes. also about growing your orchids in the house. If you use a lot of air conditioning, it takes the moisture out of the air and a lot of them need a lot of humidity. And that's why growing outside yeah. is good. And to kind of replace the humidity, just putting a dish of pebbles with some water on it next to it or underneath the pot. Um, not so the pot's sitting in water, but on top of the petals or pebbles. Um, and it helps, but to put them just in an air conditioned environment, they will dry out and then they'll suffer. That's great. We're going to move right into talking about caring because I think we've had some questions and that's, you know, one of the main things we we get questions about. And so we've sort of touched on it a little bit, talking about growing them indoors and out, outside and the advantages and disadvantages of both of those. So we're gonna first kind of just mention the types of light um, needed. Um, we'll talk about uh, a little bit about watering. Um, so um, Linda, do you wanna mention um, just light requirements for outdoors and quickly say indoors as well, where to place it? Okay, I can. Um, usually you can divide your orchids into what is called low to medium light orchids. Uh, these are like your fails, your paps, your um, melatonias. And since I grow orchids under an orchid tree and hanging, these are the orchids that I put close to the trunk of the tree. So that's the shadiest part of the tree. And then the other group are the medium to high, and that's a really broad range because that includes your cattleyas, your cymbidiums, your dendrobiums, all the rest of them. So those, again, um, need more light. So if I'm going again outside, I move them out towards the edge of my tree limbs. And I, at the end of my tree limbs are like the dendrobiums, which need a lot of light, or the, and then the oncidiums and the um, cattleyas I sort of place around. But again, I move them around because you can look at an orchid and tell if it's getting too much light or not enough light. If you got really beautiful, dark, dark green leaves, that's not a good thing. That means your, your orchid's not getting enough sun. On the other hand, if you get a really bright green, you know, light green orchid leaf, then you probably got too much sun. So you want to move them back and forth on your bench or in your yard or on the tree limb or whatever to get the right light. Um, but there are some orchids that need pretty shady areas and there's some orchids that need bright light. Bright light and direct light, they are not the same. You don't want to put an orchid in the sun, especially in the summertime here, because you can burn the leaves up. They'll get sunburned, you know, just like you and I would. Yeah, and I think we have a picture of, of what a sunburned leaf looks yeah. like. And I think once someone sees that, they'll realize, oh, yep, I know what I did. <laughs> it, was, it was direct light, not bright light, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so just also to mention, you know, anytime we talk, we talk about landscape plants a lot, but house plants, orchids that move in and out, it's right plant, right place. So you need to know what you've purchased, you know, temperatures to, to grow it at, light requirements, all of those sorts of things. Do a little bit of um, research. 
Yep, you're right. Research is important. And I mean, obviously you can call us with questions, but you know, know what you're purchasing and what type of light you have in and around your landscape. Okay, so we'll move into talking about um, watering. Um, so Mary, do you wanna talk a little bit about watering and then mention maybe, um, Kathy talked a little bit about how she watered outside, but if one were to also bring the orchid inside to enjoy, how often should that be done as well? All righty. Um, when you have your orchids outside, you want, to, you want to use a hose usually and really drench them. Let the water, what I do is I water through them once to get them all damp and then come back and really give them a good soaking. You want to, on a lot of your orchids, you'll be able to see roots sticking out of the pot um, over the top because they do try to hold on to things. And that's a, you can watch those roots. If you've got them enough water on them, they'll turn green. They have kind of a sheath over them that's sort of silvery looking. And uh, when they're dry, they look very silver. Um, if you watch the roots as you're watering, you'll see that sheath sucking up water and it, it almost becomes see-through and then you can see the bright green root underneath it. Uh, that's a good indication that you're getting water. The plant is soaking in water. Um, another common method that a lot of people use is they, drin they, they drench them in a bucket. If they've only got one or two, you know, just a few orchids, they will actually fill a bucket up and sit the orchid down in the bucket and let it sit there for a few minutes and then take them out. Um, you want to, you don't, you want to water your orchids when they need water. You don't want to, if, if you get on like, okay, I water every Thursday and it's rained a lot that week and your orchids are outside, you probably don't need to, to water on that Thursday. Okay. You need to take a look at your orchids look at the media that they're in, see if it's damp. Uh, because if you water too much, you can very easily cause your orchids to rot. Um, and that's one of the biggest killers of orchids is to get too much water. With orchids that you have inside, you can basically do the same thing to them. You can put, run water in your sink and let them sit in the sink with water just up to the top of their pots where it'll, it'll sit there and they can soak in. Um, orchids that have, they're actually growing in pots as opposed to net baskets or wooden slat baskets need to, those need to be watered more than orchids that are in pots with media because the media is gonna hold moisture around your orchids, the roots. Um, and the old wives tale, about, oh, all you need to do is give it an ice cube once a week. That's exactly what that is, as an old wives' tale. Your orchid might survive for a little while. It's not going to do well. First off, no orchid ever lived in the Arctic. They don't, they don't need to be chilled with ice. Um, and secondly, that really doesn't give them very much water. So it's, you're just better off if you really pay attention to your orchid, pay attention to its roots. Um, if you buy, if you, if you plan what orchids you buy, that's really the optimum thing. If you're like probably 90% of us to go to the store or go to a nursery and we see an orchid, we've just got to bring home because it's beautiful. Make sure that you do research on what kind of orchid it is and where it would have lived if it were still wild because that'll give you a good indication of how much water it needs and how much light it needs also. Great, thank you. I'm glad someone had to ask in the chat about the ice cubes and I'm, I figured you'd mention that and I'm, I'm glad that you did. Yeah, we don't wanna be putting ice cubes in them. No, get yeah, that that's, soaking water. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. one of my pet peeves is mm -hmm. the whole ice cube story. <laughs> And one of the things I might note is just that if you're putting your pots in a bucket of water, you have to be careful if you use a community bucket because you can spread um, pest and fungus by just dipping one orchid and then the next orchid and then the next orchid. So you have to make sure, it's like Mary said, just have a few orchids 
and you know they're in pretty good health. Uh, if you have lots of orchids, I would go with those. Oh, good point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so next thing we're going to move into talking about is fertilizer. And we do have, we've had a couple fertilizer questions. So if you have any more as we're talking, um, you can type that in the chat. And I'm going to have uh, Kathy go ahead and start about fertilizer because you had mentioned that you fertilize them. And um, we had a question about um, do you put fertilizer in the water and pour it over? Do you soak it in a bucket and water? And then um, if you could also mention, like, um, I think the uh, fertilizing year round. Do you do you fertilize year round? Do you follow a schedule? How do you do that? Um, I fertilize. I don't fertilize as often as I should. That's one of the things that I kind of neglect. And um, but my orchids show that. Um, but what you do never fertilize onto bare dry roots after you water like you water once a week, whether you dip them, whether you spray them with a hose, whether whatever, however you water them, that's when the roots are wet, you fertilize then. Follow the fertilizer directions on the container and um, weaken it. And one of the things that I have read over and over is water weekly, weekly. You um, like half your solution and when you fertilize in the spring and summer, you're feeding that plant so that it will um, be able to bloom. And there is a bloom mix too, or you can change your um, N, it's NKP, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, and you adjust it accordingly. Um, they have 10, 10, 10, 12, 12, 12, like for cattleyas. Most orchids use basically the same chemical amount, but um, maybe a little bit different. But you have to know what you're using and um, you have to know when to use it. In the wintertime, when they're in their dormant stage, you cut back on the fertilizer and you just use regular fertilizer. You don't use a bloom fertilizer and you only fertilize like once a month. They don't need it and then start back up again in the spring or when they're going to be flowering. And that, and not just, just not to advertise, but you have um, your new gardening books at the office that's an excellent place to keep track of how you keep your orchids. I'm starting to do that just because I love that book so much. And it's an easy way to know when you fertilize and when it blooms and when you've repotted. So. Um, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. That's a that. great idea. You're really, yeah. Yeah, you're really it's a great idea to keep, your keep keep track. Oh, yeah, absolutely. particularly if you're new to growing, um, tracking all of that is, is helpful. And you can advertise our garden guide and, and journal because um, the master gardeners wrote and um, are selling that and that is available for purchase um, at our office. We can put a link in the chat, but I mean, we, it is however you want to record it um, is, is important and really helpful, you know, as well. So yeah. Thanks for mentioning. Julie stuck that in the chat there if anybody's interested in, in seeing what that looks like or purchasing that. Um, Dave, can, uh, I, can I add yeah. a bit? Yes, please um, go ahead. I am like Kathy in that I'm not good at, at fertilizing my orchids. Um, I feel like they get leaves stuff in there and you know they can it decays and it serves a good purpose. However, when in the springtime, I am used this book um, as a guide. And what they tell you to do is, and Kathy mentioned it, is use a balanced fertilizer, but I use an Osmocote fertilizer in the spring. And I put, you know, the recommended amount in my orchid pots and that lasts three months, which gets you through, you know, the, the growing, the big growing season with that little bit of extra fertilizer. And so I do not usually uh, fertilize any more in the spring than that. And then like Kathy, I don't fertilize a lot in the wintertime at all. And the other thing about fertilizer, 
which is something I just learned at a class I went to, is that when you use your balanced fertilizer, look at the nitrogen. Nitrogen is, it needs not to be urea-based nitrogen. It needs to be ammonia-based or um, nitrate-based and not urea-based nitrogen, which is not good for your orchids. So look at the fertilizer you're using in terms of the nitrogen content. You don't want a high nitrogen fertilizer. Yeah, thank, thanks for mentioning that. Um, all you know, all the whenever you're purchasing a, purchasing a fertilizer, make sure you're looking at the bag. We want to follow the recommended amount that's um, on the bag as well, as far as mixing and diluting and applying and all of those things. And obviously, if you have questions on fertilizer, you can um, contact our office. Uh, Mary, anything else you want to mention? Do you want to mention anything on fertilizer? Um. I've always used orchid fertilizer. I know a lot, some people, especially some places that raise lots and lots of orchids, um, they'll use a regular fertilizer and just tone it down, uh, make it a little bit more dilute. But I've always used orchid fertilizer. And I use water soluble so that you mix it in with your water that you're going to water your plants with. Um, and that's just always been easiest for me to make sure that each orchid gets the, the fertilizer that it specifically needs. But there again, I'm dealing with a lot less number of orchids. And it's easy for me with water-soluble fertilizer to mix up a quart or, or a gallon and use that. Um, and, if you, and, and you can look for Bloom Booster water soluble fertilizer or just your regular standard like I'd say it's more of a maintenance fertilizer to use that way. And I use water soluble fertilizer 90% of the time it's just during that one time I put that Osmocote on. Yeah the the Osmocote products for orchids have come a tremendously long way and they're really good especially if you have an orchid that you have in a pot with a lot of media, that way you can put that Osmocote in there and they do really good. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah, I like it. They I also, like it a lot. And, it's, and there's a couple different um, brands, also, but, but look for the, look for orchid. Kathy, oh. you have one more thing you wanted to mention and then we'll move on to pots. Um, yes, um, I've seen them at orchid shows at um, our orchid meetings that um, some of the growers for your um, slab orchids and your vandas, they, in a little wire mesh um, ball, they put the soluble orchid yeah. pellets or fertilizer pellets into that and then hang it right on top of the plant. And that way you aren't worrying about um, how much to put or whether you did it or not, you just hang it and then in your little orchid reminder book, you put down when you did hang that and then it slowly dissolves and you don't have to especially fertilize those things, but it does give them fertilizer that they need. Great. Yeah, and that seems to work really well. Great, lots of yes. suggestions on fertilizer. And if anybody has, well, you know, obviously circle back around um, at the end and um, if you have any other questions on fertilizer, but we're gonna move into um, different ways to um, grow your orchids. Uh, Linda, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? I've been, okay, I grow 90% of my orchids in clay pots, which is the middle picture. And you'll notice that I number my pots. So number 12 is a particular orchid. And I have uh, an Excel spreadsheet that tells me what number 12 is, when it blooms, um, when I've repotted it, and that kind of information, when I bought it and who I bought it from. Uh, that works for me. Uh, if you keep your all your orchids consistently in the same pot, then you solve some problems about watering. If you use the same medium, and they're all pretty consistent. So you, you know when you going, when you water, you water them all, it's probably okay. I like to also to grow them in baskets. I, this happens to be a plastic basket, but I also grow them in wood baskets. 
those tend to need more water and the liquid fertilizer works a lot better than the solid fertilizer, which just falls out of the pot. And I've been playing with growing orchids on trees. The one on the, um, the left is a little Meltonia. I just replanted on a, uh, put on a, a slab of tree bark. And you, again, I use pantyhose um, for, the, um, for the fertilizer, little pant pantyhose for the fertilizer to hang. And I also use something like uh, the pantyhose or something sometimes to keep the sphagnum moss around the orchid so it's okay. And then the one on the far right is just the orchid I stuck on a, it's a, um, can't see it because the thing there, I think it's a dendrobium. I just stuck on an uh, oak tree to see if it would do it. They're doing great. I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So again, when you go to hang them or go to pot them, look at your orchids. Some orchids do better in pots. Some orchids do better in baskets. Um, some orchids don't care. They just don't grow in anything. Great. So, Kathy, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the ways that you, you grow them, containers you keep them in? Um, I have the cattleyas uh, mainly in um, clay pots and they have the little air holes down towards the bottom. Um, these are my pictures and I've, um, I got them mainly to show you the root system, the white roots and then the little green tips. Those are healthy roots. They're on um, a slab and you just put, you can buy a low, um, long plastic um, strip that sort of, um, locks itself and wrap that around or put holes in the bark and then um, put your uh, orchid there and put it around the orchid. Um, I grow some in the ground some, because there are ground orchids and when I put them in the ground I um, put them, I mix the sand that's already in the ground with a little bit of um, the light fur bark and some um, of the perlite and um, pretty much use that in a little bit of dirt, mix it together so that it does have good aeration. And I have fairly decent luck growing that, them that way. I have a couple of ground orchids that are in pots. One is the nun orchid and another one is um, bamboo orchid but you still have to use the medium, the certain kind of medium, like I said, um, mixing what is normal for them for generations to what um, is being made today to use them. So you kind of get the things together and mix them up. Um, you can usually find, um, you can usually find the menu for them, the recipe on the internet. Um, I have, my um, the things that I do worst with is phalaenopsis, and that's because I just put them into light, but they need to be, all, all my phalaenopsis are in clear plastic pots so that the roots, because the roots grow, um, they like the light, but the leaves, I end up losing my leaves um, because of too much light. Um, and then the dendrobiums I usually put in plastic pots just because they can handle it. I've got a, some um, on the bark. I've got some in baskets, the big, I've got a sh couple of Schamburkias that I have in, um, it's just got the coconut um, uh, medium in there and um, I grow them that way. And then they're in the big baskets and they're hanging. So there's a lot of ways that you can do it. You just have to um, see other people doing it, I guess, and ask a lot of questions and have somebody help you the first time you do them. Great. So that's a little bit about different containers, different ways to grow. Um, we're gonna talk about now propagation. So making more, growing more, um, dividing different ways to do that. Um, the first way is propagation using what's called a kiki, which is a cute little word. Um, and we'll have Mary, if you want to talk about um, using uh, kiki for propagation. 
after some orchids will make what we call a kiki, which basically means a baby orchid plant. Uh, Phalaenopsis will do it sometimes. Uh, they do it. And so this picture here is actually a dendrobium that is creating. You can see there's a little baby plant there. If you see the rightmost picture, you can kind of see that it's growing straight up out of that cane. Its roots are going downward. Um, a lot of times plants will do this when conditions were not right to bloom or they have finished blooming and then they they will kick out they will start a kiki um usually once a cane starts a kiki it's not going to bloom until that is grown and and someone you take it off of there uh in order to take them off you would clip that off some people will leave the clip the cane on each side and leave a little piece of the cane attached to it. Uh, and you treat it basically as though it were an adult. You want to leave it on its parent plant until it has nice roots like this. Because if you take it off too soon, it was still relying on the parent plant. And, and it, won't, it won't be able to sustain itself. You need it to be able to feed itself and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but if you clipped this off, you would just treat it just like the parent. If you have the parent hanging, like you can see this, you can see one in a wood slat basket in the left-hand picture. You can see that that orchid's growing in a wood slat basket. Um, and you would be able to put that little orchid, of course, in a smaller basket, uh, put it in a basket. You could also mount it quite easily on a piece of wood, however you choose to grow it. Uh, the biggest thing is uh, you need to give it the support it needs to stay upright and, and just let it grow. But understanding that it may not bloom for literally several years. Great. Thanks for talking about that. There's also another way to, um, to propagate and that would be um, dividing orchids. Um, Linda, do you want to talk about how to divide an orchid? Okay. Um, most of us probably propagate by division. And this just happens to be a non in my yard, in my hanging from my tree. And this one I've let um, sort of get out of control. This thing is a couple of feet wide. But it's real easy to see that if you look at this carefully, there are three, three easily three different plants in this orchid. So you can depending on, um, this is probably pretty tough. They're real fibrous, um, they're thin roots, but they get really entangled. I usually sterilize a knife, you know, and I would simply cut, you know, from here, you can see this from the left, sort of down to the middle, right, right about there coming down. And that would be the one plant. And then I'd take, go to the right and I'd cut this one off That'd be two plants, and then I leave my mama plant in the middle. Um, when I redo these, depending on the kind of orchid, you want to clean out the old medium so you don't have old medium left in there. And unfortunately, this one is well due a potting because I've probably not any medium in there. That's probably just a root bundle. But you need to make sure you sterilize your knife. Sterilize your knife. Most orchids, Cattleya orchids, you simply do the same thing. Some of them. Usually how you can sometimes tell there's a nice place to divide them. You want to make sure you sterilize your, your instruments you're using. Um, some of them you can just pull apart. The key thing on some of them is you want to make sure you have a, what I call a forward bulb that has a little bud so you know that's going to continue to grow that way. If otherwise you get a back bulb, as Mary says, it could take years for some of these after you repotted to, to rebloom. What do I use? I use alcohol. Generally, you can. Um, my husband also has one of those little things that you flip for a grill thing that has a flame on it. You can flame the knife. Um, I usually I use alcohol. You can use. We, have, we do have some information. Um, I think there's a fact sheet, um, Julie. If you could check on sterilizing tools. Okay. Um, with the different mixes and things, we'll, we'll look for that and put that in the chat as far as how to sterilize tools. I mean, general 
the tools. Blades is good. Um, too. Blades is good. Just mm -hmm, makes yeah. you rinse really well. Otherwise, right. you erode your instruments. So those are the things I use. Yes. Yeah, and it's recommended for doing lots of things um, in the landscape. So if we can find that, we'll pull that and um, put that in the chat for you all. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about propagation. We did have a question about orchids, which orchids can be grown in the ground. Are there other orchids other than those cymbidiums that can be grown in the ground? Um, orchids. 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 Okay. Okay, we'll pull up a fact sheet on that and put that in the chat as well. Um, so Nun's Orchid up there, Julie put the disinfecting garden tools in the chat. That's a great one to, to pull up and book. That's a great one to bookmark because you'll need that for other things probably as well. And so Nun's Orchid can be grown in the ground. The, the um, I forgot the one now that you just mentioned <laughs> earlier that was in the ground. There's, it, there's one called a bamboo orchid. Okay. That it can be grown in the ground. Okay. Great. And um, also the Bayus, yeah, and uh, Peppa, Peppa Phyllium, Peppa, I can't even pronounce it, and Harbaneros can be grown in the ground too, um, and Belilia, you just have to look them up, but they are ground orchids, and their roots, um, they're terrestrials, meaning that they grow in the ground originally. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, right there, your um, jewel that's orchid. That's actually a picture, yeah. Of which orchid yep. is this they, now? That's the jewel orchid. Okay, great. Um, so that can also be grown in the ground? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so or we're, we're starting to get close to 10 o'clock. We'll, we'll keep, putting, um, putting, keep putting questions in the chat. We're going to run through some problems um, that might be some common problems that you... Um, encounter. We talked a little bit about sunburn earlier, and I think it really helps to see in a photo what sunburn looks like um, on a plant leaf, and obviously an orchid leaf is there. Um, Kathy, do you want to talk quickly about some of the other, these are common problems that you might encounter with orchids. Um, the fungus in the middle one, and also the brown spot, we had so much rain this summer, and if your plants are outdoors, you can't really cover them over to protect them. Um, but cleaning the leaves, um, cleaning the leaves, talk to, um, you know, your grower that you know, or um, someone that grows orchids, find out what they use best, because there's a lot of stuff out there that you can use. Um, and clean the leaves off on a regular basis and make sure your orchids aren't crowded, especially if it's raining a lot because air circulation helps dry the leaves. Water your plants in the morning so they have a chance, the leaves have a chance to dry off before the nighttime dew hits them um, are just some of the things that you can do to protect from funguses and black spot and stuff like that. Um, what do you use to treat? Right. What, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, the question in the chat is what? about um, white spots. They think it's from mealy bugs, so we'd have to confirm. Yeah. I mean, first thing would be to confirm whatever the pest is. Um, An orchid. The American, orchid, the American or orchid Society has a wonderful resource called Orchid Pest and Diseases. Um, you go online and they have it online. Once you identify, or actually it helps you identify because it's got some really good pictures. And once you identify it, then they have a list of recommenda recommendations in terms of fungicides and pesticides that are recommended for orchid use. Okay, also, Julie put of, a link to that in the chat in case anyone wants to pull up that book as well. A lot of things that get on orchids like mealybugs also get on your fruit trees and other um, things. So um, you treat like the whole area, but you can use whatever, you know, is used for the, them. If you're working on get mount mealybugs on your mangoes and you've treated them with neem, then um, check with like a grower, check with um, the master gardener um, clinic um, 
or someplace like that and find out what is the best thing to use and then use that. Maybe pesticides are too strong for your orchid, so they can tell you the best way to do it. But yeah, and I think those I think those books are good. And then I think we were going to move into talking about the orchid societies um, and resources. And I think it's a good time to mention um, how helpful the orchid societies and shows might be. Um, I think these are both the two books that you had mentioned, Linda. Is that correct? Yeah, these are the two books that yeah that I keep close by. Great, great. Yeah, so those are the two books, and Julie did put a link to one of those in the chat of the orchid. Uh, pests and diseases, um, but there are, too. yeah, both purchased online, yep. Um, and, and online, you don't have to purchase the book. Oh, okay, great. So I'm, I'm assuming there are local orchid societies and shows that could assist um, people here um, in Polk County. Um, Mary, do you want to mention what those might be? Sure, um, we have an orchid society here in Polk County. There's also an orchid society uh, that's just south of, of um, meets down in Sebring. Uh, that's an excellent orchid society. In general, orchid societies, the people are very friendly, very helpful. Um, and you can, you know, normally, most orchid societies at their meetings always have like a guest speaker, kind of like we do at our monthly meeting where we have some kind of educational thing going on uh, where we get to learn some stuff before the actual meeting. Uh, also, a lot of orchid societies will do repotting and for a small fee or just a lot of times just bringing your own pots, that sort of thing, they will help you by repotting your orchids. Um, and also at the orchid shows, a lot of times orchid shows, like the one that's held there at the Stewart Center, um, there's guys there that volunteer their time to repot orchids for people. And it's done just for a donation. Um, and those are done, usually the shows are done by different societies. Each society yeah. usually puts on one or two, some of them even two shows a year. Mary, where would they find um, the Orchid Society that would be nearest them? Is there a, web, a central website or where would they, they yeah. find it? If you look on the American Orchid Society's website, okay. you, can find a you can find listings there of, okay. of the local Orchid Societies. Okay. And we'll put that in the chat too so people can yeah. look there and find what's... And would and the shows also, be there also? Yes. That's an excellent okay. source of looking for you know, you want to take a day trip, look up there, see if there's something going on. Great. Yeah, can I okay. Make, can I Go ahead. Quick comment. I would really urge people to join one because not only are they doing all that Mary does, they also will often give away plants. And while that's really nice to get a free plant, the great thing is that they give away plants that grow here or grow in your area. Of your, and so uh, that's the best place to start. Go there and may ask them, get plants that they're thriving here. You, to be successful, you want you want to start easy. Yeah, that's great. It's it's so nice to have that as a resource for us here for so many things. And clearly people can call the plant clinic, but I think an orchid society is 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 perfect, um, particularly since there's such active ones around here. Okay, so we're about out of time and um we're going to just take final questions in the chat and any final comments from the panelists as well. Um, so if you have any final questions, you can type them in. And I have a few in here to pull up that I'll just um, ask um, the panelists. Um, this first question is, um, as far as the sunburn leaves, can they be cut off and then you move them at that point? Or how would that work if someone has the issue of sunburn leaves? Uh, Linda, do you want to answer that? Yeah, actually, um, you can cut them off or just cut that part out, or actually you can leave them as long as you see they're not decaying or anything around it, the damage has done, been done. Um, okay. Again, I'd probably move my plants so it didn't get quite as much sun. Great, okay. Um, and the next question is about potting medium. Um, and I know we have talked about this amongst our group before is bark, 
moss, what, what should people use? Does it, is it dependent on the orchid type? Um, Kathy, you want to talk about that one real quick? Um, yes, it's pretty much depends on orchid type, but a lot of orchids use the same mix and you can buy them like at Lowe's or Home Depot, any store. Um, I get a lot of my supplies a lot of times when I go to orchid shows, um, but they come in a bag. Um, charcoal is another thing that um, is good to use. I mix the perlite and the charcoal and the bark, depending on the plant, I use either uh, medium bark or large bark um, to anchor the plants. And then they live off that bark as it starts to decay. So it's important, um, but that's basically what you do, but do your homework, look up either in the American um, Orchid Society or look up in a book like, I have two ortho books and I have, um, I use, um, there's Better Grow, it's an orchid um, grower and they have books and they come from down in, um, just south of um, Bartow. Um, I use their books. So I have four books plus the Orchid Society that I use and I use, um, the Master Gardener website, um, the handouts at the office. Uh, but yeah, and I think we have some I, of those listed on the previous yeah. slide too. Yeah. So we do have some resources listed on our previous slide and we will get that information to everybody. Yeah. Um, all of the stuff that we, oh good, the Central Florida Orchid Society is mentioned yep. and um, yeah, all of our uh, other orchid info and then the books and we'll, we'll send that all out in the- um, when I get everyone. an orchid too, and when I buy an orchid, if I'm at an orchid show or if it's at my meeting or whatever, I ask the grower, what kind of light should I use? How often should I fertilize it? What kind of medium do you have? I ask him and then I put a note and I put it right with my thing. And when I make my tag, which is another thing we haven't mentioned, but put a tag on, if it doesn't have it, put a tag on your orchid with the name and the date and when it's repotted. And I also put down um, low light or whatever, the last time it bloomed. Those things are important and you won't remember them, but it's, um, I do talk to the uh, grower and I, whoever has grown the orchid that I buy because you get it home and after the blooms are gone, they all look alike. <laughs> yeah, that's great information. I don't know between you, your tags with all the details and Linda's Excel spreadsheet, I feel like orchid people that grow orchids are awfully uh, organized. And um, but yeah, I mean, I get it. They would all look very similar when they're not in bloom. And you all have to take some tips about that, right? <laughs> Just buy a garden. <laughs> I say one other thing I would say about the median is I personally never use sphagnum moss. I put everything mine in bark. Um, right. Okay. And if it's in right. stack walls, I repot it. Okay. Okay, so I think we're out of time now. Any very last questions, you can type them in the chat. And then I'm just going to kind of go down the line. And um, if any of our panelists have any one last thing to mention, um, if you don't, that's fine. If you have a favorite orchid you want to recommend to people to grow, whatever it might be. Um, Mary, you want to one last comment from Mary? Sure. Um, we, have our, we have a native orchid right here right in here in the Tampa Bay area in Cyclia tampensis. Uh, they've been called numerous things over the years, dancing ladies, all this sort of thing, but they're a beautiful little orchid. If you want to, they bloom in May to June. Uh, if you want to see them blooming, go out to Circle B and they're in a lot of the trees out there um, and they're a gorgeous little orchid and they're not difficult to grow. Um, one of the really brilliant things about them is they will grow outside hanging in your trees and do quite well. Um, so that's a plug for my favorite native orchid. Great. That's awesome that there's a native one that we can grow. I know native plant lovers will like to hear that. That's cool. Uh, Linda, any last thing to add? No, I would just say um, by, by, once you get started, you become addicted. <laughs> Once you get started, you'll have an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yes. Um, Kathy, any last things to add? Um, yes, 
be sure and bring them in when they bloom and they make your house beautiful and they smell gorgeous 99 percent of them so that's my treat to me that's orchids taught me patience because they take a whole year to bloom and then when they come in it's well worth it great that's a that's a that's a great point and a good comment to to end on um we did have one last thing the name of the native orchid i don't know julie if you can find that online it's um, Oh, it's she's called, put it in there. She's fast. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's it, yeah. the one that I was talking about is called Encyclia tampensis. Okay. So yeah, Julie put a link in the chat. Um, we are out of time now. We're a little after 10. Um, just a reminder, if you didn't grab all the links, um, we'll put them in your follow-up email um, where you'll get the survey and um, all of this info as well. Um, most likely this one will be placed on our YouTube channel. You'll just have to give us a little while to get that, that posted um, so you can you know, reference it. There was so much great information. I think this would be a really great reference video for people to have. Um, but obviously, if you have any other questions on orchids, our plant clinic is open to email and phone call and all of that. And um, we can take your questions there. And so... Um, Thank you so much, Mary and Linda and Kathy. What really great information. Um, I, I appreciate you sharing your expertise with everybody today. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a great Saturday.